among the present answers to the question, what are schools for? There is, first of all, the god of economic utility, which tells the young that they are what they do for a living, and that therefore the main purpose of learning is to prepare them for entry into economic life. The idea is to teach the young how to make a living, not how to make a life, which has always seemed to me the point of education as it was to Jefferson, Horace Mann, and John Dewey. Related to the god of economic utility is its unholy son, the god of consumership. In this tale, the young are told that the surest way to earn God's favor is to buy things. It tells them that they are not what they do, but what they own. Its principal commandment is conveyed in the slogan that I've seen on some t-shirts. Whoever dies with the most toys wins. Now this is, of course, a dominant narrative of television which exposes the young to 600,000 television commercials in the first 20 years of their lives. Apparently, many schools love this God, as evidenced by the fact that 5,000 schools in America now require students, as part of the curriculum, to watch Chris Whittle's TV commercials for Nike, Mars bars, and other delectables. Then, too, uh, there is another god, the great god of technology, which insists that the main purpose of learning is to help the young to accommodate themselves to vast technological change to become what the technology will make them become. Now this is a narrative based on the false and somewhat hysterical premise that never before has there been so much technological change as now. For those of you who believe that our own century is unsurpassed in technological innovation, I should like to mention just a few of the inventions of the 19th century. Telegraphy, photography, the rotary press, the telephone, the typewriter, the phonograph, the transatlantic cable, the electric light, radio, movies, the locomotive, rockets, the steamboat, the x-ray, the revolver, and the stethoscope, not to mention canned food, the penny press, the modern magazine, the advertising agency, the modern bureaucracy, and, for God's sakes, even the safety pin. Now, next to this, the information superhighway, email, and virtual reality do not seem to me to be so stunning and disorienting, and it puzzles me why so many intelligent educators have lapsed into a gee whiz mode about technology. For those who believe that modern technology will provide a significant narrative around which learning can be organized, I should like to read to you a short poem written by a teacher in the early 1920s. This is the poem. Mr. Edison says that the radio will supplant the teacher. Already one may learn languages by means of Victrola records. The moving picture will visualize what the radio fails to get across. Teachers will be relegated to the backwoods with fire horses and long-haired women. I like that line. <laughs> or perhaps shown in museums. Education will become 
a matter of pressing the button. Perhaps I can get a position on the switchboard. Well, I, I don't go as far back as the introduction of the, the radio and the Victrola, but I am old enough to remember when 16 millimeter film was to be the new god of learning, then closed circuit television, then eight millimeter film, then teacher proof textbooks, now computers. Like the teacher who wrote that poem, I know a false God when I see one. I must also mention here the rise of still another God, which goes by several names, including the God of tribalism and separatism. In its most fervently articulated form, it is known as the God of multiculturalism. Now, before saying anything about it, I should specify that it must not be confused with what once was called cultural pluralism. Cultural pluralism is a 70-year-old educational idea whose purpose is to enlarge and enrich the American creed, specifically to show the young how their tribal identities and narratives fit into a more inclusive and comprehensive American story. If people use the term multiculturalism as a synonym for cultural pluralism, there is, as I see it, no problem. But when the term is used to promote a curriculum of exclusivity or a point of view that stresses above all else love of tribe, implying separateness from, if not hostility to others, then multiculturalism is indeed a dangerous god to serve. The argument is sometimes made that such a multicultural curriculum is justified when an entire student population is African American or Mexican or Puerto Rican, as is often the case in our large cities. Now this might make sense if it were the task of public schools to create a public of hyphenated Americans. But our students already come to school as hyphenated Americans. The task of the public schools, properly conceived, is to make the hyphens less distinct. The idea of a public school is not to make blacks black, or Koreans Korean, or Italians Italian, but to make Americans. The alternative leads, quite obviously, to the balkanization of public schools, which is to say, their end. This path not only leads to the privatizing of schooling, but to a privatizing of the mind and it makes the creation of a public mind quite impossible. The theme of schooling would then be divisiveness, not sameness, and would inevitably engender what Arthur Schlesinger Jr. has called the disuniting of America. Now, when I am done here, we'll have some time for questions and comments from the audience. And some of you may want to argue with me about my critiques of the gods of economic utility, consumership, technology, and tribalism. If you wish to do so, I will help you now by making my position as clear as possible. I believe these gods have no transcendent spiritual content. They offer no basis for moral conduct, no rules of community life, no metaphysical integrity, no sense of continuity. Their existence suggests to me a spiritual emptiness in our culture, 
a sense of confusion about what schools are for and about what they can be for. And this emptiness and confusion are the major problem facing public education in America. Yes, it is true. We need to improve our facilities. We need to pay teachers more. We need to reduce class size, find better ways to assess learning, and as our mayor keeps saying, eliminate an unwieldy and expensive bureaucracy. These are technical problems, and if we have the will, we can solve them. But even if we do, we are still left with the question, what are schools for? If you will allow a metaphor here, we can make the trains run on time, but if they don't go where we want them to go, what's the point? I might add here, since I just made reference to Mayor Giuliani's uh, recent attack on our public schools, that in comparing Catholic schools to the public schools, he neglected to mention the most significant difference between them. That Catholic schools most definitely have a spiritual transcendent narrative that gives coherence and organization to learning. The public schools do not.